Good morning. Welcome to First Parish Unitarian Universalist in Medfield. We're so pleased you're all here with us this morning, and welcome to all of you who are streaming in from home as well. This congregation first gathered in 1651, and this historic meeting house was built in 1789, which was and is still now unceded ancestral lands of the Nipmuc Nation, who inhabited this area for thousands of years prior to the arrival of the European colonists. Friends, welcome. Welcome to this place. Here we search for truth and understanding. Here we contemplate life and we celebrate its mysteries. Here we share healing and wholeness. So whoever you are, wherever you come from, whomever you love, we welcome you to this congregation. Love is the aspiration, the spirit that moves and inspires this faith we share. Rightly understood, love can nurture our spirits and transform the world. May the flame of this chalice honor and embody the power and the blessing of the love we need, the love we give, the love we are challenged always to remember and to share. world ravaged by violence, by hatred, by conflicts that seem eternal and unsolvable. Sometimes the only thing we can do is to be still for a moment, to remind ourselves what is real. The sun that rose this morning, the dirt under our feet, the air whispering in and out of our lungs. So this hour, just try to be present in each moment as it unfolds. Your simple attention is what makes all of these moments holy. Come, let us worship together.
Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn, Where is Our Holy Church, number 113 in your gray hymnal. seated. Let's quiet our minds now as we enter into a time of prayer and meditation. Oh, spirit of life, spirit of love, source of all being in which we live and breathe, we come together in prayer, even though many of us struggle with what that means. come together before that which is greater than us, although we might struggle to say what that is. And so this morning, we pray for those things we struggle with, the conflicts we feel within ourselves, and between us, and those we love. Pray for guidance, compassion, for the opening of a path, and pray for those things that give us joy and hope, those things that we trust in, that we believe in. These are great gifts of grace. And perhaps we need not define them in order to savor them, to rejoice in them, to be thankful for them. What we do know is that we gather this morning with all kinds of needs. Some are facing physical problems and our need of healing. Others need healing of a different kinds, emotional and spiritual. Some are facing family problems. Some are weary with the struggles of life seek assurance that this will someday pass. For each of us, we speak the deepest prayers of our hearts in different ways, knowing that what it means for them to be answered will look and feel different for each of us. May we always hold in our hearts gratitude for those things that bless us with their presence. Forgiveness for the ways we have turned from those blessings. And the willingness to open ourselves anew to this beautiful and hurting world. As 
Pause now for a time of silent meditation. Now I'd invite forward Becca Cornett to share with us the morning's reading. Our reading this morning is by Kate Landis. In my life, I have received this big, engulfing, no questions asked love from old church ladies who winced at my blue hair but loved me anyway, from my do-we-have-to-talk-about-feelings little brother when I was shattered into depressed, weeping shards on the kitchen floor and he sat beside me, from seminary friends after I told them, terrified, that I wondered if a person with my mental health history could be, should be, a minister, and they said, hell yes, from church board members after I shoved my foot halfway down my throat, from nurses in the psych ward, I am broken yet beloved. In all the moments when I needed love but didn't deserve it, hadn't earned it, couldn't appreciate it, love enveloped me, a bounty without end. I saw this bounty in my congregation fearless, unshakable love for each of this world's broken souls. It's why I fell in love with them. Every Sunday, we say, whoever you are, wherever you came from, whoever you love, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It knocks the wind right out of me. I didn't know the human heart could hold so much love before I met this congregation. Thank you, Becca. Well, friends, at a recent minister's meeting, a colleague of mine told us that he had spent the summer in Boston driving one of the tourist trolleys. He said it was hard work, as you might imagine, spending all day, every day, winding his way through narrow, congested streets, and at the same time providing visitors from around the world 
with information about our fair city. He learned a lot, he said, and not only about Boston drivers and tired tourists. The biggest thing he learned, he said, was a reminder that this is the way it is for so many people who work outside of the home, commuting, putting in long hours, sometimes without a break, getting home at the end of the day, exhausted, drained, and then getting up the next day and doing it all over again and again and again till they're bone tired, until they're soul tired. Well, as the summer progressed, he began to realize just how fortunate he is as a minister. Ministers work hard too and get bone tired and soul tired, but inherent within the work we do is that we are to take care of the soul, to take care of our souls. An important part of the ministry is to read and reflect and even pray. We're to think deeply about life in general and our lives in particular. It's not only our intellects and emotions that are stretched in the course of a day, but our souls as well. His experience driving that trolley reminded him that most of the people in our congregations don't have the luxury of time and flexibility and focus that we have. And therefore, he said, he realized that one of the most important things we can do for our congregations on Sunday mornings is to provide the time and the space for reflecting and remembering and renewal. A time for our weekly spiritual tune-up. Well, when I was in seminary, one of the things I was taught that each day I should, quote, make an appointment with God. Well, I was not a Christian and pretty sure that a concept of God in the traditional sense was not part of my belief system either. So the idea of making an appointment with God well, it was a foreign concept and surely one that I, I thought would never become a part of my life. You know, but however, as the years have gone by, I've grown into acknowledging the wisdom of this advice. Because what I have come to know is that I must be serious about caring for my soul and setting aside the time each day to do that. The way it works is like this. Each day you write in your calendar a specific time, like say from 6 to 7 a.m., and note that this is your appointment with God, or soul work, or spirit time, or, or pondering time, or whatever words that make the most sense for you. And then you honor this appointment in the same way you would with a client, or a student, or a boss. It has the same priority in your calendar as all your other appointments. Well, I've been doing soul work for some time now. Sometimes this involves meditating, going for a long walk along the beach or in the woods, sometimes journaling. I've used guided imagery. I've chanted. I've omed. I've opened my chakras and smoothed my aura. I've used prayer beads, bells, gongs, meditation apps, candles. I've enveloped my body with the sweet smoke of incense. And I do have to say that all of this has made a real difference in my life. One of the biggest differences was just learning how to pay attention, to remain in the moment, and really notice what is going on around me to practice the art of mindfulness, as the Buddhists would say. You know, not only when I sit at the window watching the birds at my feeder and the squirrels munching below, but also when I walk out into the early morning and sniff the air and watch the sun filtering through the trees. As I stand at my kitchen counter and notice the tiny white seeds in a pepper that someone gave me. As I pick up the phone and I hear tension or despair in the voice on the other end. 
mindfulness, paying attention. I have to confess, I am certainly not mindful all of the time. I uh, do sometimes struggle to take the time to pay attention. After all, I live in the same world that we all live in. A lot of the time I'm just too busy or in too much of a hurry. Sometimes I'm caught up in my thoughts and not really aware of anything going on around me. Sometimes I get caught up in my feelings and I'm totally self-absorbed, feeling sorry for myself, depressed, angry. Sometimes I'm just tired and I want to space out in front of the television, not paying attention to anything of merit. And then I remember the wisdom imparted by Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk who has so many followers all over the world. He reminds us that the miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on the green earth in the present moment. It's a miracle, he says, to be able to walk on the green earth right now in this present moment. It's a miracle because how often do each of us walk or run through life with our eyes fixed on some distant goal or immediate task, brows furrowed, panting for breath? How often do we slow down enough to pay attention to something other than that tape that's going fast forward through our brains? or the clamoring that reaches out with bony fingers and grabs us as we run by, breathless. How often do we walk in the green earth in the present moment? Thich Nhat Hanh goes on to say, peace is all around us, in the world and in nature, and within us, in our bodies, and in our spirits. Once we learn to touch this peace, we will be healed and transformed. It is not a matter of faith, it's a matter of practice. We need to bring our body and mind into the present moment, and we will touch what is refreshing, healing, and even wondrous. Now, the thing is, is that if we have ways of centering ourselves, ways of paying attention to what's really happening around us, it becomes easier to keep things in perspective and avoid irrational fear and anxiety. But how do we become aware of this peace that's all around us and within us? How do those of us who are caught up in fear or who struggle with that more mundane stuff like empty refrigerators and piles of laundry and driving kids to school and catching trains and keeping the boss and client happy. How do we find the peace that Thich Nhat Hanh promises? Well, sometimes the image of a bowl is used. It's the practice of Buddhist monks to walk out into the world ready to receive whatever is given. They carry with them a begging bowl, which they hold in front of their bodies. Into this bowl, the people will put things that will sustain the lives of the monks, whether it be a few coins or a parcel of food. Sometimes, however, when the monk is not able to receive the gift of life, it will turn the begging bowl upside down. And isn't that the way it is with so many of us? It seems to me that when we forget to make that appointment with that higher being, a deeper part of ourselves, or take time to refocus ourselves, or slow down enough to pay attention. We go through life with our bowls turned upside down. There's no container for the gifts of life, for the miracles of life. And even if we do attempt to carry the bowl right side up, our anger or our confusion or our fear will cause cracks in the bowl. And those things put into it will seep out through all the cracks. You know, it's said that every minister has two or three sermons that they keep preaching over and over again. Well, this is one of mine. 
Those of you who have been listening to me preach over the years keep hearing me talk about how important it is to slow down, to pay attention, because life is awfully short, and it would be a real shame to miss it. So think about those bowls and try to keep yours right side up so that you will be ready to receive whatever it is that life brings. I know it's scary sometimes to think about opening ourselves up in this way. And we know that we can't always control what life will drop into that bowl. We know that sometimes something may end up there that will startle us, make us sad, cause us deep pain. We know that it's not only peace that's all around us and within us, it may sometimes seem a lot safer to keep that bowl upside down or to walk around with a bowl that's cracked and filled with holes. A woman I know who was the assistant head of a Montessori school tells about an experience she had following the death of her best friend. Her friend died of pancreatic cancer. It was mid-December in Connecticut. And as she tells the story, when I went to work that week, I did something I had never, ever done before. I closed the door to my office. My fellow teachers understood. No one attempted to disturb me. My office looked out over the front of the school with high floor to ceiling windows. And I would sit at my desk and watch each morning as the yellow school bus pulled in front and its cargo of Small children tumbled out carrying their little lunch boxes, mittens dangling from strings, and backpacks sporting superheroes. While mothers laughed and plotted their days together, some of the children made the ritual stop to swing on the low-slung dogwood tree branch just before entering the building. As the week progressed, I found myself getting angrier and angrier. Didn't they understand? The world was not the same. Something had changed. Why don't they see it? On Friday morning, there was a small tap on my door. I could tell by the sound of the placement that it was a small child. I really didn't want to open that door. But I took a deep breath, and I gritted my teeth. And when I opened the door, there was three-year-old Caroline with a plate of Christmas cookies in her hand. Hello, Nancy. I just wanted to give you these Christmas cookies. As I bent down to receive the cookies, Caroline whispered in my ear, and I just wanted to ask you, how come your door is closed? I looked at Caroline and said, I don't know why it's closed, Caroline. Let's open it. The three-year-old child gave me a gift that I will have with me forever, alone, I never could have opened that door. But the lesson I took into my heart will continue to serve me. Now, sometimes we need each other to open the door that we've closed. Sometimes we need each other to turn the bowl right side up. Sometimes we need each other to seal the cracks and to fill up the holes. Sometimes we need each other so that we'll be strong enough, courageous enough, to walk through life like this. Thich Nhat Hanh says that the real miracle is to walk on the green earth in the present moment. And that when we're able to do so, we will touch the peace that's all around us and within us as well. It's not a matter of faith, he says, but a matter of practice. I'm pretty good about taking time each day for sitting, for reflecting, for writing. I've also continued to care for my body as I walk and bike each week. I know that when I take time like this, I'm able to walk on the green earth in a different way. I know that a peacefulness becomes part of me in a way that's not possible when I rush through life, heart racing, brain overthinking, fingers clutching. My hope for each of us is that we find ways to keep the door open and to carry our bowls right side up so that we will be able to receive and hold on to the gifts of life, the blessings that come unbidden, and the peace that drives out fear.
so may be. Amen. Well, now I'd invite forward Fritz Fleischmann to introduce the offering. Good morning again. <clears throat> As you know from the order of service, this week's offering is shared with the Medfield Coalition for Suicide Prevention. Now, <clears throat> I was looking for a poem for this occasion um, and I didn't find one, so I wrote a little haiku. Here it is. Generosity, gentle goddess whose worship brings joy to all hearts. Let me read that again. Generosity, gentle goddess, whose worship brings joy to all hearts. So let us worship her. Please rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, Tis a Gift to be Simple, number 16 in your gray hymnal. Having found stillness, may we share peace. Having received connection, may we reach out to others. Having heard the call of our deepest self, may we live in greater alignment. Having returned to our center, may we expand the circle of love.
I will now extinguish our chalice. But may its light and warmth stay in our hearts until we meet again. Here ends our worship. Let our service begin. <laughs>